Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to return to our Linux internals and talk about the virtual file system for Linux right after this. <music> So, you know, I started to number these and then I kind of gave up on it because people are watching these out of order. And actually, it doesn't really matter which order you do these in. It's just that I'm just trying to give information on each one of these general topics. And they all play together uh, inside of the Linux system itself. So today we're going to be talking about, this is a massive one. And I'm not going to be able to do this justice in a video, but I can get you started I can explain some of it to you and I can let you go out on your own because there, there is just so many things about the virtual file system and we would be here for weeks, literally weeks before we got, we touched it all. But anyway, let's get started. So, <laughs> so the virtual file system is an abstraction layer and the reason why I'm kind of laughing about that is that I was, I was once on a call with a customer and, um, I, it was, you know, object-oriented programming was pretty new. Uh, Rational rows was around and this whole layer of, of how to do things and how to manage things and how to write software was just emerging. And, uh, and so I was talking to them and was trying to explain to this customer how that we were doing things new. And I used the term abstraction layer and the customer said, I don't want a Van Gogh painting. I want something real. And I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. And and so I had to painstakingly take a step back. And I was trying not to talk down to them, but obviously they had never heard of this before and had to explain it to them. But an abstraction layer is, you can think of it like, uh, well, the, big, the, the easiest way I've ever heard it said was, you're building a house, you frame in a doorway, but you don't know what kind of door you want yet, but you do know you want this size door to go there. That's an abstraction because you don't have a door in your house yet, but you do have it framed for one. So it's kind of a placeholder. It's kind of a way that you can add new doors to the system. You can change out your door without having to rebuild your house. That's the whole idea behind it. So but it really makes possible for the construct. Now, this was originally a Unix construct that everything is a file, but Linux adopted that. So it is now the Linux construct. Uh, so everything is a file. So Linux has a, a long defined a, a file system as a hierarchical collection of data organized into directories, subdirectories, and files. And you can have one or more of those. You can have <clears throat> directories without subdirectories. You can have files without directories. But the point is, is that you can you organize these things starting with the root file system down. If you don't know what I mean by that, I have a video about the Linux file system on my channel, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes so that you can review that if you wish. But Linux uh, has a requirement for a file system. It has to implement four things. It has to implement an open a read, a write, and a close. Those are the four things it has to implement. And, you know, <clears throat> Linux generally regards these things as objects, even though they're not objects in the classical term of programming, they are objects that Linux is managing uh, in memory. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. But he said this was gonna be a virtual file system. Yeah, so Linux doesn't stringently define what that file system is. It doesn't have any. It doesn't explicitly uh, hold the uh, the developer of a new file system to the fire. It it just provides some broad stroke places for the implementer to provide the details on what their file system is going to do, and that is one of the reasons why Linux has such a rich ecosystem of file systems to choose from. You can implement VFAT, you can implement NTFS, you can implement Apple's HPFS, even Apple's file system itself. You can implement NFS, Samba, you can implement EXT4, XFS, ButterFS, ZFS, the list goes on and on and on. 
But it's the reason for that with the virtual file system that all of these things exist. But more importantly, Linux maintains a separation between that file system and the actual device. So well, I'll show you how this is all put together, so I won't, I won't try to jump ahead. But that's the other reason why Linux has been able to very quickly adopt new technologies, going from rotational disks where you had to worry about tracks and sectors, positions and, and boot tracks and all these things that a physical spinning media would have, to SSDs, which, which were kind of laid out in a, a matrix, which had a, a X and a Y grid, and now, and now they have a Z grid as well because now they're stacking uh, those are, that memory architectures on top of each other to give additional storage space in the same amount of, of in, a, in a nice package for a SATA SSD. But yeah, it, it allowed us to, to the freedom to develop those independently of having to worry about the device itself. So you can think of the virtual file system as an imp that, it, that Linux defines as kind of a hook for an implementer to, to create something and hang that file system on Linux and allow it to access your new file system, whatever that might be. Uh, or it could be an older one that you're using as, as well, and those are fine. Linux doesn't specify a default definition. It's totally left up to the implementer to provide that. So again, it provides them the freedom to develop what they want in order to provide the best experience for whatever their file system is trying to achieve as a goal. So let's let's take a let's let's take a step back for a second. Yeah, I'm going to be doing this again. I'm going to be diving into the shell script and kind of showing you examples of these things because I think it kind of helps. You can talk about this stuff all day, but you know, if you don't show it, it means nothing. So let me bring this, make this a little bit larger here. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do a PS and, and that'll tell me what my device is, it's PTS slash zero. Because I'm using uh, a shell, a, uh, a terminal emulator, I don't have a console on this machine. Now if I was on, if I was on a server, I would, but I don't have a console here because I'm actually inter, inter, uh, interacting with X windows at the moment. So we'll, we'll do it the same way. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna write a, uh, let's see. Um, and then I'm gonna pipe the output. I'm gonna send, I'm gonna redirect the output to dev and it's uh, PTS zero, which should be my window that I have open here. And yes, it is. But <clears throat> you notice that bash, all it did was, now echo is a bash command. And so Echo just sent some characters to dev PTS zero. It didn't know what kind of device it was. It didn't really care. And the device didn't care what it was being sent. It was just looking for characters to read and then it was just gonna write them back on the terminal window. So all of that uh, interface went through the virtual file system to do that. And that's what I'm trying to show you. All right, so let's, uh, let's, get, let's trundle on. So, you know, the virtual file system kind of fits in the total architecture. It talks with the memory manager, it talks with the process scheduler, and it talks with the network interface. It does talk through the interprocess communication, but that's done at, via the memory manager. So, and the process scheduler as well, by the way, because there's processes that have to communicate with each other and memory that has to be allocated. So, but, uh, VFS implements things like we said, ext4, ButterFS, NFS, which is a network file system. Samba would also be another one. And then we have some special ones like slash proc and tempfs, and there's some other uh, special ones as well. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about those right here. So if I were to draw uh, a map and I, didn't, and I just had user space by itself, User space would be my applications. If I was writing in C, then I would have some I.O. libraries that I called in in order to implement the, the system calls to do an open, a read, a write, and a close. Those, and those would generate system calls to do that. A system call, in, in turn, is inside the kernel, which would then call virtual file system to see what is, what, you know, it has, an, it has a name of a file, and VFS is responsible for determining where that request goes. 
And so it determines that, and then it sends that uh, that generic request to the implementer's code. So if the file system was ext4, then VFS would, would hand it off to the uh, driver inside of there to handle ext4, which would in turn manage the device driver to access the SSD or the NAND or the rotational media or whatever. And then you have NFS, which is going to go across the network. And again, that, that is all done by the implementer, not VFS. VFS doesn't know anything about NFS. And then PROCFS is kind of a special case. And we'll talk about that separately. There's also TempFS and DevTempFS, which are... TempFS is used to implement slash temp. And DevTempFS is used to implement slash dev. And those are created at runtime. So Linux is going to, uh, as it boots up, it's going to canvas and it's going to find the devices that are attached to it. And then it's going to set up character and block device drivers accordingly, uh, according to what uh, it finds in your system. So then you have C groups, which is used uh, generally as, as part of the container management system, although there are other things that C groups does as well. So that's kind of a generalization to really call it part of the container management system. It's not, but C groups have to do with that kind of thing. But those are temp FS and C groups are accessors. They they are the syscall goes directly to that. They do not go. They do not generate file I/O commands because they access memory directly. So they bypass a virtual file system to do that, even though they're still shown usually as part of the total Unix I.O. system. So VFS sits between the system call layer and the implementer's layer. And sometimes you might hear that refer, VFS referred to as a shim layer because without it, there's nothing on which the implementer can hang their code to talk to the kernel. So, uh, yeah, and so VFS then uses the implementer's code to reach the device, and the device driver in turn, excuse me, it, it VFS uses the implementer's code to reach the device driver, and in turn, the device driver uses its code to reach the device itself. So, and then uh, accessors, of course, as we said, don't don't do anything. They they don't do IOs. So. Why did we? Why did they do VFS? That seems kind of weird. Why did they just shove that layer in there? Well, what they wanted was an, a a way to be able to implement new file systems over time. They didn't want to lock Linux into a single way of thinking and then have to write rewrite the file system layer every time someone came up with a new idea. And so that VFS promotes code reuse. It means that I have something that will generically handle syscalls, and then people that are implementing those parts of the system can hang on my virtual file system, and everything will work. If I issue a read, it goes out, it does a read, I get data back, and I stick it in memory, or wherever I'm going to do with it. So I, the device driver can then focus on worrying about the device. The file system can worry about how to implement the opens and the reads, the writes, and the close. That's the implementer layer. And then VFS can worry about what system calls and where those system calls are routed to. That's all it has to do. So a side note, um, how do you find out what file systems are actually real? I mean, we've got all these fake ones, right? Or Well, not fake ones, but they're ones that are attached to the mount layer. How do I just differentiate between ones that are physical mounts and which, I don't know if you've ever done a mount, but there's a lot of stuff that spins back up on the screen. And so how do you tell the difference? So I'm gonna delve back down here again. And I'm gonna do this command right here, which is the uh, mount. And this, you know, I, I'm gonna pick up some extra information because all I'm doing here is I'm eliminating uh, I'm eliminating the SD, the device type SD, SDA, SDB, SDC, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's all I'm looking for. And then I get a list back. So I should see some garbage in here, like NVMe, because I didn't look for it, right? Uh, but we have SysFS, PROC, UDEV, DevPTS, TempFS, and then there's my NVMe drive that showed up because it's not a, it's not a, it's not an SD. So and then the security, 
that would be a bug, right? So I would have to go back and fix it, fix this idea. So uh, there's a C group and it's on system T type. There's a P store, uh, there's EFI var and so on and so on and so on. There's a lot of different stuff that this is all handled uh, within it. There's fuse control. Um, I'm not quite sure what I have in Fuse right now. It's interesting. I didn't realize I had any devices that use Fuse on the system. Interesting. But that will give you an idea on where you can go to get stuff out of this. So, yeah. There's uh, one other thing that I wanted to show you, uh, and that is this. So, on the Arch Wiki, there's a explanation of temp FS, and it's a very good one. And in fact, it talks about one of the ways you can pick up a little extra performance. If you let your temp file sit on an actual storage medium, there's a lot of IOs that get generated. And in fact, if it's an SSD, that could cause the SSD to wear level quicker. So you have really two reasons why you might want to move that. And now, am I saying you, you have to? No. Am I saying you should? No. I'm making this your your choice because there's some there's some positive pluses which is the performance side and then there's some minuses so let's talk about it so the idea here is is instead of implementing my temp file on a, a hard drive or an ssd or an nvme instead i want to put it i want to allocate memory for that well you have to stop and think a minute about what temp is really meant for temp is meant for uh, applications that are writing temporarily, like say a sort, it writes in the input pattern, it does the sort on the temp, and then it spits out the sorted order back to the console or to the file system, wherever you had it directed. But all that work was being done uh, for that process that one time, and when that process ends, you don't need that data anymore, do you? I mean, I mean, it's, you got your data, it's out, you, you saved it. So the temp file is really meant that when you restart the system, it gets blown away, it gets, it gets erased. So one of the ideas that a lot of people have had over the years is just put your temp file into memory. That does cost you some memory though. Um, and the example here is your, I don't know, maybe I should bring this, blow this up just a little bit more so you can see. Uh, but uh, let's see, right here, we're doing, we're looking at our FS tab and I have a temp FS that's mounting a slash temp. And that is the temp file system. It's read write. There's no devices, no set UID and the size is two gig. Now that's the maximum allocation. Doesn't mean that it's gonna just take two gig out of your memory. As, as the temp file system is used and as files are created, it's gonna store it in your, your memory and it's going to take it away from your memory from your other applications as it's used. So the, the other thing is that it will react just like a file system does when the temp file uh, fills up. So it will cause things to stop. Um, the other problem is if, if you were to run out uh, and you don't have enough temp file space in memory to launch the applications on startup, your machine is not going to boot. So... Um, you kind of have to be, I would go high and then see how it uses it and then pare it down versus going setting it really low. Now, if you're on a low memory system, you probably aren't going to want to do this. You know, if you're on a system that only has two gig of memory, well, obviously this isn't going to be a whole lot of benefit to you. You would prefer to use your memory to execute processes and not hold your temp files. But uh, this is a very good article and it goes through some other things that you can do with it. Uh, and I'll put this link right here in the show notes as well for you guys, so you'll have that. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to provide as much information as I can about all of this because there's just no way and cover it all today. So, all right, proc file. Proc file is a very weird construct in Linux. It's a file system, but it's not a file system. <laughs> so. What do I mean by that? So files are entered into the directory, but they don't actually exist. They're not really there until you access them. So what kind of a file system is that? What do you mean the file, the, you mean the data doesn't exist until I read it? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. That when you go to read it or write it, then it exists. 
So, huh? <laughs> it's a shared memory object is what it is. So it's used by the kernel to be able to keep to present state uh, into the file system. And it's a snapshot of that state that's going on. So the kernel will only provide that state if you request it. So uh, and and that allows processes. Uh, uh, so that allows your process and user space to be able to access that and do and do something with it. Like for example, top uses it to find out what processes are running, how much memory it's taking. HTOP does the same thing. It uses the slash proc files to find out about that. Glances goes a step further. It not only looks at the memory and the number of CPUs and the activity that's going on, but it also talks about the network, what's going on there, and it also look, uses it to look at the file system and what IOs are going on. So yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff that are, is in there. I mean, you can find out information on the interrupts, on the virtual memory in your machine. You can find out what the scheduler is doing. You can, I mean, there is a directory that's created for every process, and it uses the PID number to create the directory. And inside of there, you can find out information about all the about each processes that each process that is running on your system. So also in Proxys, you can find the settings such as the ones that you made in sys, uh, sysconfig, sys, yeah, syscontrol.com, which is where you set temporary variables in the kernel that, that gets set to allow the kernel to do things like act as a router or to block a set UID to a file system or you know to set a maximum number of whatever, of uh, inodes or, or files that can be opened. But there's all kinds of things that you can do with the proc files. And, and um, so you said it was kind of not there. Yeah, it's, so it kind of goes back to that premise as if a tree falls in the forest and it makes a sound and nobody's there, does it actually make a sound? <laughs> proc files are kind of like that. Is it if there's, so the proc files are there, but they're not really there until you read them. So. Let's go find out how that works. So I'm going to clear this off here and I'm going to bring this up just a little bit. But first thing I want to do is now I'm going to do a file. Now that's a that's a, a very specific type of IO. It's querying the status of the file to see to get information about the file. It's not going to read it. It's not going to issue a read. So what will we get if I try to access well, here let's let's do this first. So, what files do I have in here? Well, I've got all kinds. So, there's meminfo. That's one of the ones that I have. There's ones on locks. There's there's scheduling. There's IRQ, and then each one of these over here is the process ID of a process that it was running is running. Uh, so let's let's do this. Let's do a file. And it says it's empty. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, that's because I didn't read it. But what if I re what if I issue something that reads it? Let's do a count on it. This will read it. And this time, I got some data back. I got 53 characters back. So <clears throat> let's do a more. Now that looks a lot more than 53 characters, but I only asked for one line, so I didn't ask for everything. But you can see that I'm actually reading out of shared memory with the kernel. The kernel is going to tell me the memory that's that's total on the system, how much of it is free, how much of it is available, how much is used by the buffer, how much is cached, and on and on and on. So I can just keep going down through this. And I can get all kinds of information out of the kernel about that. So, uh, all right. So wait a minute. How how big is it really? Let's do an LH. It says zero. It says zero right here for the length again. So <laughs> that's another file stat. And it's not actually reading the, it's not opening the file to read the number of characters. It's actually going out to see what is actually entered into the directory. And that's all I know about it. So, okay. Um, let's go on here. So 
So you mentioned sys, and you didn't tell us anything about it. So sys is actual files. They're real files. They exist. They're created, and they're, and they're not static. But they contain actual readable and writable data files. And the files in sys are known as K objects or kernel objects. A system service uh, has a reference counter for K objects. So sys serves as a reference counter for K objects. It's, it's kind of like a scratch pad that the kernel is using to determine if something is still in use or not. And so as something is used, it's, it's going to count reference up. It's going to count up. So the more things that are used in a, a block of memory, the more counters there are. The more things that are reading a file, the more counters there are. But as, uh, as that counter reaches zero, the kernel knows, hey, this, this resource can be freed. I can get rid of it. I can tear down all of that memory that was allocated to it or whatever, and, and return those resources back to the system to be used by other processes. You might have heard the term uh, application binary interface. You might have heard it as stable ABI. Same thing, uh, but that's essentially what sys is. So, and sys is certainly not static. It, it is, it is it's always being updated, and it updates about, I think, once every well, I don't know. It, I think it's constantly being updated. So, but it's kind of a scratch pad to determine when to reclaim resources. That's as simple as I can put it. So I made a video about the Berkeley packet filter or the enhanced BP, uh, BPF. Um, so there, there's currently around 112 tools that are in that collection. If you go out and you look for a package called BPF uh, BPFCC-Tools, you can install that on your system. And that actually will, uh, there is, there are the Berkeley Packet Filters is a interface that sits between user land and the kernel to allow you to make queries about different objects that are running in the system that could be totally different than what's provided by PROC or by SIS. So you can actually use it to actually do tracing. You can actually trace a program as it executes through the system. You can trace the file IOs as they're issued to the disk. Uh, and you can collect information in real time about what's going on with your system. And that will help you make tuning adjustments if you need to. Maybe I've got too much buffers uh, allocated for the system and I, don't, I should be leaving that memory for processes that need to run. Maybe I need to increase uh, the number of file opens that I have in my system because I can suddenly see that I'm opening close to the maximum number that I've allotted to the system. There's a lot of different things you can do with that. So some of these tools, uh, some of these 112 tools, allow you to snoop on, on the virtual file system directly. And so they will provide you with information about how your system works. There's snoops on things like open, open snoop, read snoop, write snoop, close snoop, or you can actually see, you know, uh, the information that's transferring and how much of it, how big it is, what, how much allocation it's taking. There's also VFstat. Uh, VFstat will show every call that goes through VFS. So every call that goes through there, it'll count it and it'll show you a count in real time every second that's going through VFS. So you can get an idea of how laden your system is with IOs. Um, and um, there's a couple of other tools that in there. I would I would say I'm going to put this link in here too. Uh, Brendan Gregg has a, a wonderful site about BPFCC, uh, and he goes through every one of these tools and how they can be used and examples of how to use them. Uh, and so I would recommend I'm going to leave you a, a link to that in the show notes. I have a lot of links today because there's just so much of this I can't show you all today. So. Let's go do an example. So in order for you to get these tools, now I'm on Pop! OS, and that's going to be a little different, maybe a little different for you, but. So I'm going to do a search for BPFCC, and that's what I want right there. BPFCC-Tools, and you can see I've already installed it. So you can just do this. And then it'll install. And then you'll get in your 
user bin directory, you'll get a bunch of, now this is on mine, this is probably going to be different for yours, because I've noticed that on Fedora, I didn't have these trailers. Well, here, let's do BF stat. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. It's in user has been, I think. Yeah, so um, so there's there's some of the tools that you have. I'm just going to kind of go down through here. You can you can see that there's just tons and tons of stuff that you can look at uh, in the kernel. There's BIOS Snoop, and you can look at the the list that of all the BPF stuff that's going on. Look at your cache stat, cache top, sort of like top users of your system cache. You can look at ex exec and exit files, uh, latency, Java, if you have Java programs, any memory leaks that it might be tracking, uh, out of memory uh, management, OOM, kill, if there's anything that goes on there. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> gosh, there's just so much stuff. So let's just do, I'm going to just do FS stat. I think I don't think it's both. Yeah, it's two S's. BPFCC. Now you may not have that on yours, but all right. And then I need to. Okay. So about every second, it's going to start spitting data out. And this is in real time, obviously. It's showing me how many reads per second, how many writes per second are being called. These are all calls that are coming from user land through the syscall interface to VFS that it has to handle. And you can see it's, it, it, even on this system, we're not doing that much, that it's pretty heavy. And so when you get bored of it, just do a control C and you can stop it. So you, you won't hurt anything, you're just reading it, so. Okay, so one more thing. There's a lot of great information. Uh, I, I, I didn't cover every type of file that there is. Bind and overlay mounts are used by containers, and they have a man page that is very good. I mean, uh, the ones that I have seen for it are very good about explaining bind and overlay and how they work, what they do. Um, and there's also some really good sources about C groups, which I'll also add to the show notes as well. So, and then finally, I'm gonna leave you with a puzzle. Well, kind of a puzzle, but I'll help you solve it. And it's, it's a problem that I remember getting this before I received one of my certifications in, uh, in, in Unix years and years ago. But I do remember having this trick pulled on me. So I, I don't, you don't hear about this very much. I don't hear very many people talking about this, but it still exists. This is still a thing in Linux. So let me, let me just show you what's going, what I'm going to do here. So uh, I'm going to go back out to my home directory, and I'm going to look for a file that I, I created called trouble.txt. Is it not there? Oh, where did I put it? Hang on, let me go find it. Found it. It's trouble. <laughs> it's called tough. So, so let's uh, let's take a look at it for a minute. So it's got read write and read write for the group and read for everyone else. That has 92 characters in it, and I can I'll, I'll cat it. So this is a tough file. It'll be hard to deal with unless you know why it's not working. So what do I, what, what, what do you mean it's not working? I did read it. So let's, I want to make a change to it. So let's go and let's, let's do a VI on it. Wait, it says it's read only. Why does it say it's read only? Okay. Let's, let's get rid of it. Wait a minute. I can't remove it. The heck is going on here? Uh, all right, so how about if I copy uh, I can't do that either. All right, so what if I I want to link it. Oh, it text it already exists. All right, so let's try I can't do that either. All right, what about, I want to change, let's, let's update the date. 
I can't do that either. What the heck is going on here? So you've heard of, we've talked about get FACL, set FACL. Those are discretionary access controls. There's also, um, there, there's also the normal permissions you have in Linux. Now this is another layer. This is another layer. And it is the, if you do a man on LSATTR, it's the file attributes. And these are handled by VFS. So, and in here, you can find, if you go to the, there's a LS, which allows you to list the attributes on a file. And then there is the CH uh, ATTR, which allows you to change the attributes on a file. Now, whether or not your file system supports these or not depends on which one of the file systems you're using. So pay attention to the CH ATTR manual because in there, they will talk about what things are supported in like ext4 and what things aren't what things and they'll may even direct you to the like the xfs manual to check there as well so it depends on the implementer whether they choose to implement these or not so let me uh let me just uh let's find out what's going on here we'll do an ls on top oh i have an i and an e what the heck is that so let's do a, let's do a man on change ATTR. Let's go down, find I and an E. Okay, so I see the letters lowercase e and lowercase i are in this thing. So it's one of the options, but what does it mean? I guess I should scroll this over a bit. All right, A attribute can only be open in a pen mode for writing. I have used that one before where we had uh, a system that we did not want the user to be able to read, but we wanted the system to be able to push files up to another application that had the cap Linux immutable set. And then that application was able to pull the data off of that file and read it, but it wasn't visible to anyone on that file system. So it was like sensitive stuff that was going up. Uh, C attribute automatically compresses. Now that's not supported by ext2, 3, or 4, uh, but that will automatically compress your disk files according to whatever is, is uh, set in your system kernel as the algorithm to use to do that. And there are a number of file systems that actually do do that. So um, yeah, uh, there's also the C attribute, which will be used to copy on write updates. and. D is used to candidate for backup or the dump. That one you probably see a lot in like rsync uses that sometimes. I have seen it do that. The E attribute indicates the file is using extents for mapping the blocks on disk. Okay, so now I got one solved. Now I'm looking for the I. Where's the I? So we have capital E encrypted by the file system. Again, check to make sure that your file system implements these. These are constructs that are implemented in VFS, just as a reminder. Uh, okay, we have the cap. Oh, there we uh, we have the capital I. Ah, there we go. The file with the I attribute cannot be modified, cannot be deleted, cannot be renamed. No link can be created, and the file's meta file data cannot be modified. That's what we tested. We tested whether we could modify the metadata with the touch command. We checked to see if we could create a link with the file with the ln command. We checked if we could. Uh, rename the file by doing a move on it. We checked to see if we could remove it and that failed. And we tried to see if we could write it and that failed. So, and so that is the bit that actually controls it. And it says here that the super user or a process processing the cap Linux immutability command can set or clear this attribute, but even the root user cannot do anything to that file while that is set. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I could do this. And even root will fail. So yeah, <laughs> so if you ever come across this one, then here's what you want to do. You have to be root, you have to sudo it. You have to turn the minus i off with the minus command. And now it's off and now I should be able to 
and now I just have that on, just the extents on, and that's fine. Now I can and I can write it. And I can also And then I can also set that command again with the plus I. And now it's set again. So now I can't I can't move it. Again. So yeah, that just allows you to do things like that. So I, I just wanted to bring that up to you that that, that is a, uh, it's not, you don't hardly ever hear about that being used anymore, except for sometimes people will trap you with that one on tests. <laughs> so watch out for that one. Uh, but this, yeah, it's very rarely talked about. It's optional if you don't have that on your system, look for a pro, uh, package called E2 Progs. It should be in there. So, so <laughs> So next time, uh, I think we'll we'll come back and we'll talk about network interfaces, and then I'll finish up this internals class on Linux internals, to, uh, and then I'll cover whatever things that you guys want to know uh, outside of that. But that's basically what I wanted to be able to do today. I didn't I didn't really want to cover every single aspect of it. I mean, y you can do that. Uh, I'm just going to get you started as to what the VFS is all about. So, hope you enjoyed this, and if you did, as always, please like and subscribe. Hope to all see you all again real soon, and bye for now.